We play and call it work. Hey everybody, Matthew here from MiniWarGaming.com and welcome to this week's Sit and Talk, featuring yours truly. I'll be answering your questions that you posted last week on last week's Sit and Talk. Next week, of course, is Josh and Lee, so if you want to leave your questions for them, you can leave those in the comments below. So also, just a, a little announcement as well. I've started my own personal business Twitter account. What I mean by that is we have a Mini Wargaming Twitter account, but it's for general posting of stuff that we're doing at Mini Wargaming. But I wanted a way to be able to interact even more with our viewers personally, so that you know it's actually me. So lots of times on my Facebook page, like for Mini Wargaming, I'll be replying, but I got to keep like putting Matthew, and then Mike has to put Mike. And so I wanted a place that you could ask me questions directly, follow my thoughts specifically if you are interested in that. So if you want to follow it, it's on Twitter, at MWG Matthew, with two Ts. I'll try to remember to put it in the link or in the description below. And feel free to send me questions, whatever you want. I'll do my best on a regular basis to reply to as many as I can. That's my goal with that. So it's a bit of an experiment to, to try to have that more interaction. I'll still be interacting in the YouTube comments, in the Facebook comments, and on Mini Wargaming's website as well. Uh, this just kind of gives me a place to have it be that you know that Matthew Glanfield is replying specifically and not just mini wargaming, which is fine as well, of course. So as usual, this show will be divided into two parts. The first half an hour will be here for free on YouTube. And I'll be answering your questions, and then I'll also answer another half an hour's worth of questions or until I run out for our vault members at the link in the video description below. So you can check that out after here. But only leave your questions for Josh and Lee for next week on the free one. That's what we check. So, let's just go into this. Thorell, hey Matt, when will the next season of Blood Bowl start? I think with the huge fan base Blood Bowl has, that has there are a lot of possible new vault members out there. Um, there is one planned. Just recently, in the past couple months, I gave, I, I basically allowed our content producers, so Luca, Quirk, Steve, and Josh in particular, I said to them, pick a specialist game, support it, not support it, I don't care find some guests and play a season of it. So it's not going to be with everybody here. You get, it'll be them, one other content producer, and then probably two, four, or two or four guests. And so Luca actually just finished filming a whole Shadespire mini tournament with uh, some guests, and I think that went really well, so you should start seeing that come up soon. I know, um, I believe Steve has been working on a Mordheim one, and Quirk has it in the barrel to do the Blood Bowl one. And so you should see, and I, th I, I think he's been out with Luca and then a couple of guests. But it's not filmed yet, but it is planned. So I would anticipate it in the next three to four months. So a Blood Bowl season three. It won't be like the other ones where all the content producers get together and play it. That's something that we can only do rarely just because of our production schedule and time. Well, it's just we only have so much time, right? And we're trying to produce a lot of stuff. So yeah, but there is one planned. So I can actually say that. Buzuki. Hi Matt, I have been a vault member for about three years. Awesome, thank you for all your support, Buzuki. And this will be my first question for a sit and talk. With the not so far off release of a new Gene Slither Cult Codex, what makes you think that? What are you except most excited, hopeful for? Did I miss something? Is there a Gene Slither Cult Codex coming out? I know the Tooth and Claw came out with some new models, and it actually gave you rules for those models as well, which is, I'm excited to try that out, the new Abomination, that, that big aberrant, and they added an aberrant sergeant. So when you bring a squad of aberrants, now they can have a sergeant with that heavy improvised weapon. Uh, and the Abomination is an HQ choice, so you can actually play an all aberrant army list, which I can't wait to try, because I actually have a lot of aberrants. So I just need to get some more of those sergeants painted up. The Abomination basically buffs nearby aberrants, which I love. Um, but I haven't heard anything about a new Gene Slater called Codex. Okay, so I'm just going to, well, let's say that there is a Gene Slater Cult Codex coming out. Let's answer your questions. What are you most excited or hopeful for? Well, right now the Gene Slater Cult Codex feels very weak. I've, throughout 8th edition, for my beat map bat reps, I've focused mainly on Tyranids and Gene Slater Cult. Tyranids, they're fine. I have no problem scaling my list up or down wherever I see fit. Gene Slater Cult, they are, um, they just, I don't know, they just don't feel very reliable. Cult Ambush doesn't feel very reliable. And like when we played open play, they work better because then you can use the, um, the 
chapter, there's a, the chapter approved has a couple new tactics for them. One being that you can choose to um, roll an extra dice. So uh, it's, you do roll two dice instead of one for call to ambush and pick which one you want. So the, kind of like the meticulous planning, the meticulous planning, planning formation that they had before, which was the only way I ever did call to ambush because it's too wonky otherwise. And um, so that makes it more viable in open play where I can do that stratagem like four times in the same turn and actually somehow, and maybe have my army actually do something. I'm sure that I could probably play them like neophyte heavy and make them half decent, make, play them kind of like an imperial guard army. But uh, I just, I'm finding that they're just a little lackluster in their power. I liked them in seventh edition, even though they were kind of up and down because when they worked, they worked really well. And when they didn't, they died. And that was kind of fun to have that randomness, but this time it just feels like they're just so squishy and they don't really bring anything to the table that others can't already do. So what would I want? What would I be excited for? I, like, for example, I love the new Abomination Aberrant um, HQ choice. I don't know if they just need a points reduction or... I, I'd say a points reduction in some of their special weapons would be nice because I find that I don't want, ever want to buy the heavy rock saws or the hand flamers or all the, the heavy weapons that neophytes bring because it's just all of a sudden it throws the cost so high that you're just like, is it really worth having my, my Acolyte go from three to two attacks but have them be strength eight, um, minus four, two damage? With, for the same price, I could bring another three or four Acolytes and that would allow a lot more attacks. Sure, they're lower strength, but add them all up and they, they, it gives me more bodies. Uh, it gives me more chances to to kill other things as well. So that's kind of how I feel that they've been. I've, I haven't really figured them out. Now I haven't played them a whole lot in eighth edition, so I'm not quite sure. So I, I don't know some sort of balance adjustment for them. Uh, if obviously if you introduce like the stratagems and warlord traits, so they actually get a codex, that might just be enough. Uh, it would, so like, okay, that, I guess that's the answer. If they got their, they they don't have their own codex yet. And so just having that codex and following the pattern of the other codexes where you introduce relics beyond the one that's in chapter approved, that's not even that great. You introduce um, different cults, so you have different rules. So you might be able to tailor some of what you want to do. You want to go for a close combat heavy gene stealer one, then there's a cult that's really good for that. If you want to go for more neophyte centric one, there's a cult that's good for shooting. Maybe one that's better for cult ambush. So I can see them doing that. And then just having more stratagems would be nice. Warlord traits, expanding on their psychic powers. Yeah, I think that would be enough. Just just doing that might make them a lot more enjoyable. Uh, I would. So this is what you'd like, Kazuki. I would like a points drop on metamorphs to make them more competitive. Considering pure strain gene stealers, which cost the same, are a much better option in my opinion. Yeah, so you know, things like that. What are your thoughts so far with the new aberrant HQ abomination models and tooth and claw box set? I love the models. Absolutely love the models. I'm actually using them in my kill team gene stealer cult uh, group or kill team, sorry, my, my Jesus that are called kill team and the kill team campaign I'm doing with Dave. And just using the aberrant rules because there is no abomination rules in kill team. And I just love the way they look. So visually I love the way they look. I like the idea of the rules. I haven't played them to know if they're any good, but they look pretty neat. Little Jimmy. Matt, which Age of Sigmar faction endless spells are you looking forward to seeing? For me personally, it's a deep kin in the Wood Elves. I mean Sylvaneth. Oh, Sylvaneth aren't Wood Elves. Uh, Wood Elves and Sylvaneth are, are totally different now. I know that, I'm not just saying that you mean that there's Wanderers and there's Sylvaneth, but Sylvaneth aren't Elves. And I don't think they replace the Elves. Uh, they kind of make, they kind of feel like they replace the Wood Elves, but I believe that they're going to be coming up with a lot more Elven races. So, uh, and those spells don't excite me that much. They're just like, yeah, they're cool. They look neat. So I don't really have any that I'd be excited for. It would be, it's, it's a neat concept that each book gets their own endless spells, but doesn't really have me excited. Uh, am loving the narrative campaigns. It certainly makes being a vault member worth it. Awesome. Well, thank you, little Jimmy. On a side note, I picked up a Prince Imric from the recent Made to Order Dragons from GW. He also came with a square base. All is not lost. Ha ha ha. Long live the square. Yeah, it's really interesting that a lot of their stuff still comes with square bases, uh, the older models. I'm not sure if that's because they actually still have just crates and crates and crates of this stuff. Or if for some reason they just have tons of square um, square bases, but I've been finding like we've been because we've been doing a lot of rebasing and also we've been getting a lot of new armies made that you can often pay anywhere from ten to twenty percent more than what the miniature costs just to make sure you get the right base. And I really don't like that. I, th I think that's kind of 
I think it's dumb. I know that they say you can use whatever base you want, but let's, let's face it. If you're playing Age of Sigmar, they want you to play on circular bases. And even though, they, even though they will be fine if you go out and buy their miniatures and play on square bases, the game is designed for circular bases. They even in their FAQ are like, if you don't have the right size base, then you've got to pretend it's the right size base when moving it. And that's just kind of weird and hard to do. Um, and so I think that they should include for free the bases that should go with that model. So if it, if it is a box and it already has the square bases inside, then they should always add on a little baggie of minis that you need for it. Because honestly, a lot of times I'll see our order, it's like, here's $100 of miniatures, and then here's $20 of round bases that we had to buy to go with those miniatures. And it's like, really, I'm paying like a 20% premium, sometimes 10 to 20% premium, to buy the models because I want them on circular bases. So, so that's disappointing. So I, don't, I really don't like that they still include square bases, especially if that was, if ma it's made to order. That makes it sound like they literally just made it and then they stuck it on and then they gave you a square base. Why not give you the, the, the oval base? Like why are they still producing those bases? So it's, it's just kind of strange. I know I'm not a big fan of that. Like choose one, switch over. Don't wait till you rebox things to switch over. GBC 343, salutations Matt, I hope you are well. I was wondering your take on the current direction of the fluff for 40k, as in all the major factions are pretty much business as usual, even with all the story progression. Has anything really changed? I'll be honest, the 40k lore has kind of stagnated for me. I still enjoy the books, the novels, because that just kind of ignores the overall lore and just goes into some individual story, so that's kind of neat. But um, yeah, it, it kind of feels like they, I don't know if I'd say they missed an opportunity because they can always advance the story whenever they want. Like, I don't think it needs a full Age of Sigmar treatment where you, you blow up the old world and you come back in. But when I heard that they were, I remember when they were doing, um, they were leading up to 8th edition and they were showing that warp tear through the whole galaxy. I thought that was going to change a lot more than it did. Now it's just like there are more demons. Um, but other than that, it's just like, it once again, just kind of, you know, the threat level has increased a bit, but overall doesn't feel much different. Now I know, of course, lore-wise, there is tons of new stuff happening, but yeah, you're right. In your own individual games, it's like the Tyrans are still consuming, the Flesh Terrors are still tearing, the Necrons are still Necroning, the Tower is still expanding. Like, it doesn't really feel like the much of the narrative has gone forward. Now that's tough because you look at what they did with fantasy and the backlash they got from that. Uh, although I still think it was the right choice, uh, destroying the old world and totally turning it into this new Mortal Realms thing. Um, if they did that to 40k, I think that would that would be bad. It's different though. 40k is science fiction, so you won't just destroy the galaxy and have it turn into weird realm things or into a new galaxy. That it just that would be going too far. But um, I I would I because I had several thoughts of things that would be interesting. For example, I'd love to see the Imperium fall and split into sub-factions. Uh, even if it's just in the two factions, I would love to see the Imperium have kind of a rebellion, a non-chaos rebellion, where it's just people are just fed up with this horrible, horrible empire that is currently going on. Of course, the empire will tell you it's for the greater good, just like the Tao, and, but I'd love to see like, and maybe the Tau get involved in that. Maybe the Tau somehow, and I'm just making this up on the spot, but maybe the Tau somehow can happen to turn like a third of the galaxy onto their side and they, and they form this coalition, a federation of sorts of things that are kind of people that are more about people. But then they of course, would, it, would be, it would be kind of the historical irony that then they would probably face greater threats from chaos because they no longer have the backing of all this, of the of the Inquisition and all these different factions, the even maybe Space Marines, maybe Space Marines wouldn't turn, or maybe a few chapters would turn, but um, that gets a little more complicated because the Space Marines are so loyal to the Emperor. I wish they had done something with the Emperor. I wish they either either died or reincarnated. That would have been really cool. I think that would have been a good Eighth Edition move because it's just they've been leading up to that for so long. It'd be nice to see some continuation of that, not just like. It's gotten worse continuation where it doesn't actually change anything. But uh, I love to see the Golden Throne like collapsing on itself and then throw, like doing like a malign importance thing leading up to the change where the Golden Throne all of a sudden turns off and everything's thrown into chaos. And then when the addition switched over, all of a sudden the Emperor is rebirthed and he leads a glorious new era for a certain part. But he, what this other part is like, no, screw you, you've, you've been gone for 10,000 years, we don't even know who you are. And they split off. 
Uh, maybe, like I said, maybe joining the Tau. Um, the Necrons, the Orcs, and the Tyranids, uh, that they're trickier ones because they're not really prone to alliances. Uh, there might be like little factions of Necrons and Orcs that'll ally with you, but overall the races aren't really designed well for that kind of play. Um, whereas like in a fantasy setting like Age of Sigmar, you can, you can have ogres living in the realm of heaven alongside humans and it, it can make sense even though they're destruction. You can have necromancers working alongside order because it's just chaos is kind of the one that's really opposed to everybody and everybody else could get along if they just kind of put aside their differences. So, I, I, that's, so there's a lot of opportunity to really shake things up and it just feels like they're like, well, what's, there's, we had this one Eye of Terror, so now let's make a lot of Eyes of Terror and, and all that kind of stuff. Like have Abaddon come out and just kick butt and, and really pull a lot of things off. Um, maybe make it like an Age of Chaos kind of thing where a certain part of the, the galaxy has really, really fallen to it. I know there is a dark side that's on the other side, but it's still... It's more like they just can't see the Astronomicon. But, yeah, there's a lot of really cool things that could have happened to help move along the story. Uh, I don't know if I, like, I want them to reveal more about the Tyranids. Um, you can kind of just keep them as a side faction that are always a nuisance. Same thing with the Orcs. Like, the Orcs, Tyranids, and Necrons, to me, are not the true threats to the galaxy. I know they could be. Lore-wise, the Tyranids could wipe out the whole galaxy before Chaos has a chance to. No problem. But I'm just saying that I don't think Games Workshop should have them become that much of a threat. Chaos is kind of the thing, right? So, or maybe shake it up so, like right now in Age of Sigmar, death is the big bad guy. Chaos has kind of taken a side seat. They're still a big bad guy and they're going to feature in many things. But um, with the with launch of second edition, it's been Nagash's schemes that have kind of upset the balance of everything. And so maybe choosing one of the factions like Necrons, Orcs, or Tyranids, Maybe like Gazgul Thraka finally unites enough orcs that they have another great wa, bigger than, like, not not as none that's been so big since the Beast Arises series. That kind of size, like Olinar size, and have their emperor rebirth and this once again this epic conflict between them. So yeah, I think they're they could have done a lot more. So I, I hope that they will. Like this is what I'm trying to say. It's not like oh they they missed their chance. Well no, there will be more additions. And they've been going through the codexes really fast, and they're almost done all the codexes. So what happens after that? Of course, they can just start ex redoing the codexes, and that's probably something they will do. Not that I have any information on that, of course. But the other thing they could do is just start advancing the story a lot more, a la malign portents, like do like this epic buildup. Because um, you still, you know, it's only been a little over a year since 8th edition came out, so you have at least another couple of years before they would switch editions to like 9th edition or 8.5 or whatever you'd want to call it. Uh, I, would, I would guess that they're not going to just wait two years and redo it. It's probably going to be at least a three year thing, maybe even four years. So they got another two, they got almost at least two years to go to do things, and so there's a lot of opportunity to do things more than just update codexes. I don't know if they'll introduce any new races. They could. They could, especially if they did. Some of my ideas would allow them to, but I don't see them going in that direction at all. So, so yeah. Oh, just checking my timer here. So the rest of your post here. Also, given the recent direction of the newer books like Legions of Nagash, Megat Kin, and now the Beasts of Chaos, consolidating minor factions together, is there any others you would like to, you would you think would work to good together as a single battle tome? Example: Eldritch Council, Collegiate Arcane, Darkling Covens, all together. Iron Weld, Remerge with Freegold, etc. I, st I think the humans need a good battle tome because uh, they don't really have one yet. Because Stormcast Eternals, I don't count that. Like, of course, they're humanish. But I mean, a good free guild one, and that would bring in dwarves and elves into that. Um, not like the new elves, but like the tr more traditional elves. Especially the Iron Weld, so I'd like to see that together. And then they could also combine in the, the, the magic one, the Collegiate Arcane, and all of that. Darkling Covens and all those. I don't know if you're going to see those ever get updated, to be honest. Like, they'll probably keep updating them in the General's Handbook just for at least the next few years. But um, I think they're going to get replaced. Kind of like the Eidneth Deepkin and uh, the Daughters of Cain kind of was a hybrid one where you had old models and new models were added and now it's, that, that's, that's a Dark Elf kind of thing. Eidneth Deepkin are totally Dark Elf. And so we need a couple High Elf equivalents, but I don't think they're just going to take the High Elves and be like, okay, let's add on this, and now that is our new High Elf army. I don't think that's going to happen. 
just like I don't think the wanders will ever really get folded into anything. I think they'll just always be relegated to old models, old rules, and that's that's fine with me. I don't I don't have a big deal with that or a big problem with that. So like the humans, I don't think that they're gonna. I don't want them to fold in the empire models and Bretonia models and and then add on stuff. I want them to start from scratch with a totally new free guild, not free peoples, free guild, uh, which is basically the imperial guard of Age of Sigmar. So that's what I'd love to see. Lastly, if you could swap one faction from each Grand Alliance into another, which and why? I wouldn't. They all, the only one that kind of is bloated and has factions in it that make you raise an eyebrow is Order. Um, but that's because people say Order and they picture everybody's a good guy, and that's not the case. Like, the Dark Elves are Order. Order is just anti-chaos, right? And so, anyway, so it's technically destruction. Well, destruction is not order, but death could be classified as an order because it's Nagash's order or death's order. Destruction is more chaotic because even chaos isn't chaos. It, there, it's just a different type of order. So it's just like they have their idea of the way life should be because if you read like the Hallowed Night series when they go in the Plague Garden where they go into the realm of Nurgle, it's not chaotic. It's actually quite ordered the way that everything is set up. So... What's chaotic about it is that it doesn't necessarily follow the laws of nature, so it's anti-our laws. That's why we call it chaos. Mylan. Matthew, are you a movie buff? Definitely not. I do watch movies. I've seen a lot of movies, but I would not claim, like Dave, to be a movie buff. Dave's seen ten times as many movies as me, probably. Have you seen this year's top new rom-com? Love, <laughs> actually. <laughs> So the realm of fire. Or perhaps the heart-wrenching What Dreams May Shaman, <laughs> the realm of metal. What about the terrifying Hish little baby, the realm of light. Though Gairan and It Followed was definitely darker. Or the gritty realism of Azir O Dark Thirty. I took my girlfriend to the Gilmore Gur Guriz, <laughs> Girls <laughs> feature film. Not recommended, but she did far prefer Love is Ugul Need. Shaish, that's a lot of movies. <laughs> oh my name. Oh, my then. Miso, miso. Okay, Matt, business questions again. Also, yes, I am half Canadian, so apologies for always asking questions. Why would you... Oh, you're apologizing because you're half Canadian, but asking questions is why I have the show. What is going on with the narrative campaign writing request? Does writing them take a lot out of you? Watchers in Death is excellent, especially with the more RPG aspects. That's more an experimentation thing. Writing does take a lot out of me, but I don't want to not do it. I want to have help so we can do more of it. Because the one thing that stops me from doing more role-playing, or from more narrative campaigns, is that I don't have time to write more. I find um, I, I, I could use an assistant in that sense. So I'm not looking for somebody who can come up with ideas for what the narrative campaigns are. I've got a million ideas. Because when I put that out there, all of a sudden I got lots of emails from people saying, oh, I got an idea what you should do for a narrative campaign. I'm not a writer, but here's your idea. Or even one person was like, oh, I could, I could be your idea guy. Let me make it clear. I have got plenty of ideas. Now, having said that, you can, you're welcome to keep emailing me if you want to write, but I've narrowed it down. I've already talked to some of them, and I'm going to be talking to more of them, so if you want to send me the email, you still can. Really, all I'm looking for, I'm experimenting. I'm like, okay, how can we do this better? How can we produce more narrative campaigns? Because they're our best content, and they're what we're known for. So if I could secure a couple of writers who are good at it, then what we'd do is I would meet with them over Skype, because it's not, not in person, it doesn't have to be. Although if it is, it's great too and be like, here's the idea, and we would come up with the campaign narrative, and then they would write the story times and make the scenarios. And this would allow two things. One, it would allow me to do more narrative campaigns, but it would also allow others who can't normally write and create scenarios to do narrative campaigns. So some of our content producers are, are they're great producers, but they're not necessarily great writers or good at coming up with scenarios and narrative campaigns. But if all of a sudden they're handed pre-made ones, and it's like, here, play this one out, then um, that's basically what I'm looking for. So I just kind of have to experiment with it. I, it was just this idea that popped in my head. I'm like, you know what? Let's just throw that out there. Let's see what I get for response and then go from there. On the Warhammer TV YouTube channel, some of the most popular videos are painting tutorials for the big iconic models or a basic ultramarine. Would you ever get Chris to do some videos like that to promote the channel? Well, Chris has already done over 1,000 videos like that. We have over 1,100 quick tips plus hundreds of other painting and terrain tutorials in the silver vault. So, and we, for a while we were putting out videos for free on YouTube for that as well, but they, those definitely were by far not our popular videos. And so right now Chris has stopped doing quick tips. Silver members still have access to the 1100 plus painting tutorial library, which to be honest covers pretty much 
everything there is to cover about painting. And instead now he is working hard on a new series called the Painting Academy, which is going to be a beginner series. It's designed for somebody who is just getting into painting. And unlike other courses, the goal of it is to just help them sit down and get painting as soon as possible. Whereas other courses, they'll teach beginner stuff and they'll do a fine job of it, but they'll take a long time. Like you gotta watch a few hours before you can finally start painting. And this one is literally, if Chris was sitting across the table from you and you're like, okay, Chris, I got my box of mini miniatures, what do I do now? And he's like, okay, here's the stuff you need. Now pick up your paintbrush. Now, or I, well, the assembling is part of it, of course. So here's how you clip the things off. Here's how you clean them up. Here's how you, how you glue them. But in such a, teach it in such a way that it's as fast as possible. That we're not gonna brag about how long the Painting Academy is, we're gonna brag about how short it actually is to get you painting. And then after that there'll be modules that'll be like, okay, so now that you've got it assembled, now that you've got it base coated, what are you gonna paint? You're gonna paint, oh, you wanna paint skin and fur? All right, then let's go to this module right here and we'll just walk you through that. So it's not gonna spend an hour on color theory and another hour on all the terminologies of dry brushing and, and uh, wet blending and all that. No, they'll teach that when you need it. At, at the moment you need it. So it's a very hands-on practical approach. And once that Painting Academy series is done, which I'm hoping will be done in the next month or two, Silver Belt Vault members will get it for free, of course, but then we're gonna start doing classes where there'll be both group classes and more personal one-on-one -on -one with Chris. And you don't have to be in person, it's all done by Skype or whatever we end up using for, for, for the, the mechanism of it. But then, so you can have a group class where you just pay a certain amount of money and um, even if you're not a vault member, you'll get access to the Painting Academy and then you'll meet with Chris on a regular basis as in a group setting online, like digitally, and he'll help you with all your problems. And then at a higher fee, there will be more like one-on-one -on -one sessions with him as well. So that's kind of the future of what we're gonna be trying out with our painting side of things. Because we, for, the, for years now, we've been making painting tutorials. So now we have like so many of them. It's a huge resource for people, but it's a little daunting. It's like, hey, you're a new painter, here's 1,500 painting tutorials. And this is like, holy crap, which ones do I look at? Like all the information you need is in there, but it's like giving you a dictionary to help you learn to read. It's like, well, if you learn to read, then the dictionary becomes more useful. You then you need to learn how to use that. So the Painting Academy is gonna get you painting, and then the painting, and then that'll, we're gonna be organizing the, all the painting tutorials in the vault, as well as organizing within these courses so that then they become even more valuable as well. Miso Miso again saw the DND 5th edition purchase. That was on my personal Twitter, at MWG Matthew. Are we gonna see some Dungeons and Dragons? Um, I definitely want to get back into doing role playing games for Mini Wargaming. When that's gonna happen, I'm not sure. Right now, I am running a personal D&D group, and that way I can learn it, because I have never played 5th edition before. I've played 4th edition, I've played a lot of different role playing games. I'm not new to role playing games, but new to D&D 5th edition. So I'm gonna be doing that personally at home, and then, kind of see where we go from there. But I definitely want role-playing games to be a big part of mini wargaming in the future, so. Curse of Strahd is the best product by a million miles if you're looking for adventure templates. Thank you. We're gonna start with Tomb of Annihilation, actually, which I'm really excited about. I've been reading it and studying it and getting ready, so it's a lot of fun. In the post-bunker universe, what are the business plans for the company? What do you think you will do next and what would you like to do next? Well, the bunker kind of expands on what we wanna do with the business. First off, it expands on our ability to make videos because we'll have six studios instead of four. Um, we'll have, obviously, the basic idea of the bunker is that when guests come in to play against us, now they can stay with us instead. So it, it does, it's two things. It gives them a, a, a place to stay that's not like at a hotel that they then have to find a way here. And it helps us make a little extra money as well because they're paying us to stay here. Because obviously we need to do that, running it that way. But the second thing, or third thing, or whatever, the other part is gonna be running events so there'll be all sorts of levels of events. There'll be like your basic tournaments and stuff. There's gonna be a storefront there and everything run by Max Aggression at first at least. Um, just kind of see where it goes from there. And uh, we'll be running events that, uh, some simple ones like tournaments, that kind of stuff. But then I'll, uh, the other thing that's gonna be really cool is it's gonna allow us to do things like, people have always asked me if they can come in for narrative campaigns and I've always said no because it's, it's too hard to coordinate that. But with a new place, that's not the case. That we'll be able to actually, we'll actually be able to have events that you can, you can book for and come in and be part of narrative campaigns and painting courses and all sorts of other stuff. So we, we plan on turning it into an events thing year round where we're gonna be running all sorts of things. And there will be, also, once again, all sorts of different price points. You know, you just wanna come in for something basic and stay in the rooms, there's a price point. But then there's gonna be higher ticket items as well. 
to allow you to get access to some of the really one-on-one -on -one stuff, like being able to do certain narrative campaigns combined with maybe being part of a role-playing campaign in the evening. It allows us to, like right now a guest comes in, they play with us during the day, five o'clock hits, we all go home and we say, see you later, we'll see you tomorrow if they're coming back the next day, and they have to find something to do. Well, with the bunker, there is an open gaming area, or there will be other events that we're running that they can pay for and, and, and join in on. Uh, there's a store, uh, and there's also nearby Niagara Falls, which is of course a big tourist attraction, which um, so you can convince your significant other to come down as well. And yeah, so that's kind of like the next stage in the business is adding all this other stuff. Right now our main revenue source is the vault. That'll probably continue to be the case for the next few years. And then we're not gonna abandon the vault, of course, but uh, hopefully then the bunker allows us to generate another revenue stream. And the nice thing is they feed on each other. And that is, as we sell more of these events, it allows us to then, we can take those events that are running and we can record more videos and make more content. For example, uh, if let's say I want to do a Gorka Morka campaign, um, I put out the thing saying I wanted a couple people. I got tons of emails wanting to do it and I could only choose a couple people to come in. Well, at the new place, I can be like, okay, we've got 20 slots for a Gorka Morka campaign. So what will happen is you'll come in for the week and um, you'll, you'll be playing like off camera for 80% of it and then we'll rotate everybody in or the top tables for certain tournaments or whatever into the studios to film with content producers as well. So you kind of get to just play a lot of Gorka Morka and then we're filming a bunch of Gorka Morka in the studios. We won't film every last game that's being played because there will be literally hundreds of them. And um, so you as a viewer gets to see a huge variety of Gorka Morka mobs and, you get, and then we'll do the final games of the top mobs so you can see that showdown at the end. So all of a sudden we can create more content because people are paying to come in to be a part of this and that money can then be used to hire more people to take care of them and to film and that's more videos for you guys. So that's what I'm excited about most is the synergy between the two. It allows us to build both sides of the business because then if there's more videos then more people will sign up for the vault which will make us more money allowing us to hire more people, allowing us to make more videos, allowing us to run more events. You get the idea. So that's, the, that's basically the idea. We'll see how it actually turns out. We've never done this kind of thing before so we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll see. Uh, regarding that, Miso Miso still, Ian Livingstone, Fighting Fantasy, in a recent business presentation said that game creators retaining control of their IP and promoting them is one of the most important factors in game design. Given that, would you ever reopen Dark Potential or maybe a new game, deluxe board game, miniatures, and use mini wargaming to promote the game and the IP while retaining control? The Watchers and Death Rules could be amazing reskinned and slightly simplified into a Warhammer Quest style board game. More business, Matt, expand the empire. Um, I've asked, I, I get to ask this question every once in a while in, related to, in relation to like, will we ever do Dark Potential again? Will we ever make miniatures? And the answer is, it's not off the table, but it sure isn't anywhere near the table, or at least the front part of the table right now, that the bunker is going to have to be our primary concern. It's expensive going into these new ventures, like the bunker is going to increase our costs, and doing the miniatures and all that kind of stuff, that's very expensive to get into. And I don't want to just get into it by doing a couple models here and there. I want to, I, I'd want to really get into it. I say that right now. I mean, ask me again in six months, that might change, of course. And so I picture that the bunker will occupy a lot of our business investment for the next five to ten years. And then maybe around that time, depending on how the business has grown or not, that will then dictate what we do next. Because, um, yeah, I, always, I agree, I always want to expand more. Making your own IP, obviously, is very powerful. And if we've built up a nice big audience by then, well, then maybe that, that'll give our, our, our launch board for that new IP. But that's not something I'm looking at doing right now. I think we're just about out of time for the first half hour. Oh, geez, we're over time. Okay, thank you so much for your questions. I'm going to be answering even more just for our Vault members at the link below in the Sit and Vault. I'll see you there.